chapter 15, and uh, the author uh, or editor and I kind of part ways here. Once again, I, I this is one of these things where I, if I were doing this book, I would have split this chapter into two parts. I realize she's thinking 16 week semester, which is, of course, that doesn't include your break, but that's what most of the college campuses are on, or many of them are at least, so that so you notice there's there's always 16 chapters in these textbooks, 15 or 16, and there's a reason for that. So this would have pushed it into 17 chapters with her current arrangement, but uh, I, I would think it would be worth it anyway, because as you go through this book, sometimes, or this chapter rather, it's kind of hard to figure out, is she talking about early adulthood, is she talking about middle adulthood, and sometimes she compares the two of them, sometimes she doesn't, and it's a little difficult to figure out what the author uh, is really talking about or is it both periods but in any event I'll try to clarify that a little bit and make more sense of that as as I go through this lecture so first it's a good question what does it mean to be an adult I mean how do you define adulthood is it biology or is it first of all the law says if you're well if you're 16 you're old enough to drive and if we had any sort of um, process by which we would identify adulthood, uh, some marker of, of uh, growth into the next phase of life, at least it begins when one gets a driver's license. Although I certainly know a lot of young people, well, not a lot, but, but a handful of young people who have chosen not to get their driver's license at 16, but to wait until they felt they were more ready for it and more prepared for it. 18 is the legal age of, of, of majority in the United States, yet you have to be 21 to drink. And so where is adulthood here? During, during the Vietnam era, the, the um, argument was at 18, you're old enough to get sent off to war, but you're not old enough to have a beer. And the law got changed. The drinking age was dropped to 18 in order to accommodate those demands. And I think mostly just to justify sending off those young, those, those boys off to fight our nation's battles. But in any event, in the years following that, it became evident that the rate of uh, fatal driving accidents involving adolescents who had been drinking just skyrocketed around the United States. And so one by one, the states began to lower the drinking age back down. I'm sorry, to raise the drinking age back up to 21. Now you're seeing also uh, states that are raising the age where you can legally smoke cigarettes to 21 because of the harmful effects of, of alcohol. Based upon what we were talking about a, a week or so ago about the, the brain development and addictions and those kinds of things, it, it, it may be a good thing, although it's not going to stop an adolescent, a young person from, from smoking or for drinking for that matter, but, but to at least say this is where we think you should wait until because, you know, the later it is, the less likely you are to be addicted, uh, so they say. My uh, European exchange students all tell me we have it backwards over here, you know, because most of those countries over there, they can drink at 16. They can drink beer, I think hard liquor at 18, um, but they can't drive until they're 18. And they think we have it backwards here that well, one boy said to me, you know, we should learn to drink before we learn to drive so that we know how to handle our alcohol. Eh, I'm not so sure I'm convinced of that. But, but one thing, one observation that another one of my kids made, which I think is accurate, is because we can we can drive at a younger age, but we're not allowed to drink. Um, the drinking that is going to go on tends to go go on in places where kids drive to, you know, the woods or or somebody's house for a big blowout party because the parents are away or whatever it is. Um, and so drinking and driving continues and might not happen so furtively and they kids might not binge drink if 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 it were legal. That's the uh, the argument he had. And again, I. I think that makes a little sense. Biology can also mean uh, sexual maturity. You know, as uh, if you're old enough to, well, you're old enough to make babies, you know, when you're a early adolescent. But I mean, is there a certain stage maybe when all sexual, uh, secondary sexual characteristics are in place, you become an adult? But there are late bloomers and there are early bloomers. Do you have to be tall enough to uh, where your head goes above that line to get on that? carnival ride does that make you an adult no psychologically we know a lot of people with, mor with morals in their 30s who probably aren't really functioning as as a clear-headed adult 
Sobriety is an interesting question. Alcoholics will tell you that they stopped developing socially. They stopped maturing when they started drinking heavily. And and in fact, I've had I've had a couple of well, I'd say probably guys in their 30s over the years when I was providing outpatient therapy services would would come in and were asking questions about relationships that teenagers usually resolve, like uh, going out on dates and how do you know whether you should go in or not and how late you should stay and and if, you know, those kinds of things. I mean, these are all things that most of us resolve in our teen years, um, but there's just a demonstration of the fact that, that, that really that they stopped worrying about those things when they started drinking heavily. Um, so, social age is it moving out you know when you move out of your parents home well most i think most young people come come return home three or four times on average after they've left home so would it be the first move out or the third move out or the final move out um, should you be considered grown when you've graduated from high school and fully responsible or college even now well, you know we're going to find here in a few slides even then uh, many people don't really consider uh, individuals to have reached full adult status. So Western society in particular, this is a bigger issue, of course, in the more, pro the, and again, I use this term primitive, the under de the less developed societies. I, I keep searching for the word I'm looking for there and I'm not coming up with it, but, but in those cultures, other cultures, you know, um, they have all these rites of passage that clearly mark the passage to adulthood, oftentimes much younger than we would consider um, young boys and girls to be men and women but uh, but it's some it's not that confusing in in other cultures as it is in ours different under different ways of understanding adulthood and again when it occurs freud really thought that uh, personality development was was set by the time a uh, uh, a young person has passed through middle childhood but jung says that it really is just beginning to uh, develop as the uh, individual leaves adolescence and we, we talk about individuation in the adolescent unit um, as this process of that of that as the teenager um, answers that question who am I of comparing what he believes or she believes is how they would want to be versus how their parents are and they begin to have different views and opinions um, and perhaps different values and beliefs during that process and that's that individuation process where they begin to to see themselves less as a part of a family and more as their own person. Jung says, Jung's concept of individuation I think is probably a much more uh, developed kind of idea about what it means to be your own person and he says that really it doesn't happen, individuation doesn't happen before age 40. And, and uh, you know, again, you, th you think about that, we, we hear about the midlife crisis in the 40s and things, and, and I wonder if that's a little bit about what that, that process is about as far as Jung is concerned. But, uh, but the full development of the human being into a unique and harmonious whole really doesn't happen until well into middle childhood in this theory. And the process that is the differentiation process where we develop our unique patterns and traits, our gender roles become more balanced, uh, our, our introversion and extroversion uh, tendencies also come into balance more. We're, we're just more predictable. And that's when he thinks we've individuated. Erickson, as we talked about before, you know, the identity versus role confusion in adolescence, getting that question answered who am I as that process has, as that psychosocial conflict, I should say, is resolved. The individual, the young person is then able to move on to the early adulthood uh, psychosocial crisis, which is intimacy versus isolation. Knowing who I am better, at least, I can begin to share parts of myself with another person. Um, you know, I can, I can feel affection for another person. I, I can allow myself to be dependent and to be dependent upon by another person. That's what intimacy is all about in this model. And so when this crisis is resolved, um, the individual really can experience love in, in an intimate way. And, and um, those individuals that are stuck in this phase or you know, haven't been able to resolve it tend to feel very alienated from others and alone, very disconnected. 
later in in the adult years in midlife uh, period you know we think about uh, the mid middle years and where individuals stop and kind of look back over what they've achieved and compare have they really done what they wanted when they were a young person have are they reaching their goals or have their has their life their life trajectory taken them off in a whole different direction and and uh, have they done better or not as good as they wanted um, this is the generativity versus stagnation psychosocial crisis in middle adulthood um, can, the, the person who resolves this crisis successfully is able really to kind of reach out themselves and go beyond themselves and, and their own interests, uh, not be so focused on what their own needs are, and to begin to reach out to others, um, providing care for other people, developing, um, you know, being creative and doing things that other people might appreciate, being productive, uh, making little little people i mean this is what generation is all about here in this stage you know and and uh if you're if you're child free that you you it doesn't mean just making babies it can also mean you know just using your talents and for the good of others and things that so do you have that sense in middle adulthood that you've done that or that you're on the road to doing that and, and if not the individual who's still struggling with that tends to feel um pretty stagnated in life and, and also pretty self-absorbed and I think that's if there is such a thing as a midlife crisis and that's debatable this is probably the midlife crisis for the person who is having trouble struggling with this uh, this particular stage I like Erickson I like his theories this cat says you know <laughs> 45 lives down gotten a long way 45 years I guess still haven't caught the red dot you know that's uh, the way some of us feel at this stage in our life maybe you haven't given up though Levinson is a theory that I you know I I um, perhaps I've been out of touch but this is just not a a theory that has gotten as widespread attention certainly is uh, you know other other theories like Erickson for instance but uh, Levinson's uh, seasons of adulthood uh, describes the life course as a sequence of eras that 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 go back and forth between periods of stability and times of transition and and uh, that's what this model shows you know so that that uh, the individual just doesn't step from early adulthood into middle adulthood but rather there's a period of several years where a little bit of each is going on so to speak and I guess that makes sense in a lot of ways um, Levinson also indicates that uh, there the relationships he calls them the central components uh, of, of the life structure the relationships that have the greatest significance uh, are, are um, well they're just identified as central components and usually they come from the family or from the work environment de depending upon the individual I suppose one thing that I notice about this model that's a little distressing to an older person is that uh, you know he really doesn't talk about what happens after 65 and um, you know who knows what's going on there that's well we'll look at that in the next week i suppose but uh, this model uh kind of implies again that you're you finished developing you're in your final season if you're over 65 and i hope that's not the case but barack obama would tell you golly once i've been president of the united states what's left to be done that how can you top that you know so and he's still you know relatively speaking he's a he's a young man he's still certainly uh in middle middle adulthood so he's got to figure this out and uh something tells me he'll 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 find his purpose this this is the theory that i mentioned earlier and uh, I, I really like this particular theory and frankly you know i think you could do a whole semester looking at this time period but this this notion of emerging adulthood first came on the scene in my awareness at least while i was teaching adolescence course from uh, from time to time uh, this this kind of you know came onto the scene this sense of emerging adulthood jeffrey arnett's um, description is that it's a it's a phase a developmental phase distinct from adolescence and distinct from young adulthood and so you know Hutchinson or her her author of this chapter is is kind of using emerging adulthood as young adulthood but he says that really this is an entirely different thing and and uh, 
Well, you know, when we talked about um, middle childhood and adolescence, you know, we, we said 100 years ago or a little more than that, these were new concepts, just like the emerging adulthood is a new, relatively a new concept now. And those concepts in the early 1900s developed really in large part because of economic needs. Um, children had to get be gotten out of the workforce and so and jobs had to be freed up because the unemployment rate was too high and there were a lot of financial issues. There's Im impressive immigration and the high social needs of that population and the need their need for jobs. And so we devised this, oh, you know what? Little children should be treated differently. And then, oh, you know what? Even older children should be treated differently. They're not adults. And so we, we establish uh, uh, child labor laws to get them out of the workforce. And we, we establish compulsory education laws to require them to be in school, keeping them out of the, the workforce, at least full-time work. Um, you know, we, we uh, also we establish juvenile courts so we treat them differently there so that, uh, you know, we can get them off the streets if we need to so that they don't have to worry about supporting themselves. Economic pressures on our society helped us to discover this separate phase. And I think that's what's going on with emerging adulthood these days. You know, you know, the, the cost of uh, higher education is, is out of sight. When, when I graduated from college and the this is going back a ways, but the mid '70s, you know, I I took a couple of months uh, living with my brother's family after after I graduated um, to get get my feet on the ground. I moved to Florida and you know uh, spent some time there with him and and uh, his family, and then got my own place. I had a job when I moved, and that came pretty quickly, and got my own place. Um, and um, although I had a roommate for a period of time, not so much because of economic need, but more just because it was kind of interesting, cool thing to do. But but uh, for the most part, I was on my own by that time. I didn't go back uh, home, although some, some young people did. But uh, it was easier to do it in those days. And it's not to say we were rolling in the dough, but jobs were, were perhaps easier to come by, I think. And, and uh, you know, prices were more reasonable. And, and uh, the debt that I, I had my own share of college debt, but it's not that crushing debt that uh, I hear being spoken of today. So now when you graduate, it's harder to step out on your own, to get your own place. And many young people are sharing apartments and or how, even sharing houses with a handful of people. Uh, some of them are getting into um, uh, cohabitation, you know, with a in a in an unmarried sexual relationship. Uh, that's something that also wasn't very it happened, but it wasn't that frequent and that accepted certainly in the 70s. So there's a lot of things going on now where uh, young people aren't really expected to make those commitments to career and to lifestyle and to relationships, um, perhaps that was expected in the 70s and the 80s even, you know, the 60s, 70s and the 80s. And so this, uh, once again, I think it has a lot to do with economics, as I was saying. And I think this emerging adulthood kind of makes it okay that it's not so easy to get out on your own. Another interesting thing is when it, I first became aware of this, the it was pretty much thought to be, you know, 25 was the outer edge of, of emerging adulthood. And here you see in this text that it talks about some even up to 30, which again kind of tells you that this is being adjusted, I think, to meet the social and I believe economic needs of our society right now. You know, I, I, well, the, so so this uh, this allows the young person a longer period of time to explore in social and economic roles um, um, and uh, to try out these new roles without the pressure of having to make a commitment. Um, and it's something like Levinson refers to the novice phase of adulthood in the very early young adulthood. And it's something like that, perhaps. This is, again, I think this is the this should be chapter 15 and chapter 16 should be middle adulthood, but another story. Arnett talks about individualization and default versus developmental. Default individualization is that transition uh, from from youth to adult, let's say, is defined by circumstances and situation. And we'll touch on what some of those circumstances might be in a moment. Versus developmental individualization where uh, the individual is active in, in, in um, 
you know, making those decisions and those commitments themselves, that personal agency is involved. And so those with personal agency tend to have a firmer commitment to those goals and values that are developed. And that makes perfect sense if you're if you're personally more involved in this. Um, and also, um, there's less likelihood of a, of a personality identity for closure, let's say, and and being pushed into commitments. Culture and gender have significant influence on adult roles and expectations as as uh, young adult roles, I should say, as I, as uh, we've already mentioned. Um, the gauges of adulthood are socially constructed and they vary in importance across, well, from one family to another, for that matter, from one culture to another, and in different times, like I was just talking about, you know, the, just in, in recent history, even how things are, are very different now. Uh, what is it that uh, defines adulthood, and and when is when are you expected to be out on your own? With you know, if for instance marriage uh, marriage occurred earlier, also you know in, in American society, it's now happening later for different reasons. But but um, you know that was one of those things that in, was how you define an adult. But now with with uh, marriage being pushed off into the thirties, sometimes. Um, maybe even further than that um, and certainly those individuals are functioning as adults for the most part so you all of this depends upon you know the time you're living in and 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 really what what uh, what culture what culture you're in i believe it's an interesting thing here that and this is one of these things about that individualization process uh, about being forced into making a commitment um the this uh, repeated home leaving that the leaving, returning, leaving again, uh, is more frequent for persons with uh, in in better financial circumstances, the non-poor, compared to those poor emerging adults. And if you make, if you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, I think the, you know, the the family's better able to absorb the added expense and the unpredictability of that young person coming back and leaving, coming back and leaving, uh, whereas in in the poorer families you know, the young person may not be able to rely upon their parents for, for assistance once once they've kind of crossed that threshold. Uh, it's, if you're poor, you have less time for role exploration and you may be pressured to make a commitment as soon as possible. Biological functioning, um, and again, young and middle adulthood, uh, you know, I, I again, I see two separate chapters here. You know, there's some, I think some of these bullet points here really t talking more about young adults and not necessarily about middle, not necessarily not about middle adults, but issues that really kind of f focus more upon, uh, well, sexually transmitted infections uh, with the increase with frequent sexual experimentation, unprotected sex, substance use, including binge, binge drinking and smoking, makes young adults sound emerging adulthood sound very very irresponsible but one of the one of the things that differentiates emerging adulthood forgive me if i'm repeating myself i don't believe i've said this already but one of the things that that differentiates emerging adulthood from adolescence is that yeah you're still working on on this uh you know figuring out what your role is in society and who you are all that kind of stuff um, but the big difference in emerging adulthoods is you do not have your parents looking over your shoulder all the time, you have a lot more freedom than you do in adolescence. And so these kinds of behaviors uh, are probably more frequent. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure they're more frequent in this age group. And so problems such as, you know, uh, STDs and, and um, uh, you know, HIV infections, things like that are, uh, are really greater in this. And I think this age group is really heavily at risk, as we've talked about previously. Um, one fifth of young adults aged 18 and 25 use illicit drugs in 2012. Um, this is higher than gr the groups that are younger and older. I think this is an underestimate, but that's just off my off the top of my head. It just seems like an awfully low, awfully low estimate for me. But you have young adults coming from war, returning from war zones that uh, have a variety of conditions. They're going to really require interventions on a long-term, a lifetime basis, and things like, uh, well, traumatic brain injuries and and post-traumatic stress disorders that really, you know, are going to be a major issue uh, in their lives. <clears throat> 
an interesting kind of sociological moment here, you know, where we, we look at the primary causes of death, you know, 100 years ago or so, we're more from infections, but as we, you know, we've become better able at managing infections and things like this, our lifespan has, has uh, lengthened considerably, and now we have more chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, stroke. These are things that are really uh, associated with older age, not that young people can't experience them, but, but, um, you know, and so this is for for these societies that that are rather relatively affluent, and in those countries that are more impoverished, then there's a bigger issue with infections today. Your socioeconomic position, whether in this nation, in an our culture, or in the relatively globally speaking, is always a powerful predictor of mortality and poor health, as it is for so many of our of our uh, our social conditions. You're familiar with the Affordable Care Act, and uh, as much as Congress has been attempting heartily to dismantle it, for the most part it remains. And one of the things that does remain is that uh, young adults up to the age of 26 can remain on their parents' health insurance. There are some exceptions to that, but uh, but uh, for the most part, most young people can. Um, and so would it be surprising to you to find that the most, the most uninsured group was in the 26 to 34 year old age group. And the reason for this is I think they're still healthy. Um, many people have a very short-sighted perspective on this that they think, well, I'm healthy, I don't need insurance, why should I pay for it? Because at any moment, you know, you, you could get, uh, you know, T-boned in an accident, that's why. You know, I mean, we don't know how things are gonna happen for us and what do you do about medical expenses in those situations? And that's why we have insurance, but that's hard to bring across and to to people that are still feeling pretty bulletproof in, in many respects. Um, because they're still young and healthy. And, and this is one of the, uh, well, maybe actually the primary reason that the ACA, um, that the uh, cost of coverage from state to state has been h higher than uh, people want to pay is because the healthy young people aren't putting themselves into that pool of insurables. So you're left with, with uh, well, aside from the young people on parents' insurance, you're left with older people, left with older people who you know have a lot of medical needs, and so of course the insurance is going to be more expensive. But by middle adulthood, the need for good health insurance maintenance, I'm sure, good health maintenance activities becomes more imperative. You know, strength training, flexibility training. Interestingly, now we are definitely into middle middle adulthood here. I like this line. When the children are out of home, many couples find that their sex lives are less inhibited and more passionate. When I think about, I was the last person leaving home and I, I just picture that I just, I can't go there. <laughs> but I think there's some, there's certainly some truth to that. Uh, one of the things, you know, I read many years ago, and this isn't, this last bullet isn't in the text, but, but I, I read this many years ago that, uh, Women find, uh, at least in this one survey that uh, this article reported on, women were finding that they enjoyed sex more in middle age, uh, largely because the men weren't uh, in so much hurry anymore. And, and uh, that, you know, there is, uh, older males have, as this says, you know, a, a tendency to be able to acquire an increased ability to control their orgasm. So the whole sexual interaction lasts longer and, and uh, can be more, um, more satisfying to females. So this this is out of the text, and I, you know, this is definitely middle adulthood. I mean, you know, your skin starts to sag, you get age spots, your skin's drier, your hair gets thinner, it starts popping up in unwanted places. You're, uh, you know, you lose height, you gain weight. Uh, your muscles become less strong, your bones become more brittle, your cartilage begins to fade away so your joints start to ache. If you're a woman, you know, your supply of egg cells is depleted and your production of hormones slows. Uh, you gradually lose capacity to conceive children, um, which ends with menopause and vaginal dryness results from all of this. If you're a guy, your testes shrink little by little, the volume of your seminal fluid begins to decline, your testosterone level declines, and pardon me, I'm feeling a little emotional. 
Okay, frequency and intensity of orgasms decrease, the erection becomes more difficult to achieve. These are the kinds of things we have to look forward to in middle adulthood. <laughs> and and uh, the nice thing about this is at least you don't wake up one morning and it's all happened at once. It's very gradual uh, and it happens before your eyes, but it's, it's a slow enough process in most cases at least that uh, you never notice it until you... Uh, look in the mirror one day and realize that, gee whiz, you know, I'm not the person that I picture myself to be in my head anymore. Cognitively speaking, uh, young adults, back to the, the uh, age of vitality, young adults uh, are solidifying their values and beliefs, as we talked about earlier. Um, it, by midlife, a cognitive performance uh, is stable, but there are some biological risk factors associated with cognitive decline, such conditions that that may develop in more in middle adulthood than any other period, you know, hypertension, um, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, the APOE gene, which is associated with Alzheimer's. Um, and again, you know, your low socioeconomic status is, is um, oftentimes, you know, sets up a lot of adverse circumstances early in life that uh, are risk factors for cognitive decline later on. Um, there are areas of peak performance, as is indicated here, uh, in middle adulthood, but other areas, perceptual speed and numerical ability, show a decline, although I think, um, if I remember correctly, women uh, have superior numerical ability uh, as middle adulthood goes on, but men have better perceptual speed, I believe. But in any event, uh, that's, these are all generalities, of course. Um, and if there's an overall decline in uh, cognitions in middle adulthood, adulthood, it's probably a prediction, a predictor of, of uh, some impairment in late adulthood, something we should pay attention to if it happens. So, you know, do, uh, do things that engage the brain. Uh, you, you've heard about lumosity, you know, the brain training thing. And actually, I uh, I paid for that for a couple of years. And I can see how that uh, kind of keeps your faculties sharp. It's just kind of interesting, the, the different kinds of uh, little games you have there that, that just really kind of challenge you to, you know, to use your brain that, that you, in, in ways that as we get older, we might not typically use. You know, there's also a lot of good uh, apps and a lot of good games on uh, on the computer and on your phones. You know, that I think are, are can be very challenging cognitively as well. Uh, but things that writing, reading, attending lectures, playing word games can compensate for lower education. I, I think also uh, those things also just help you keep your your cognitive faculties sharper. Um, Memory begins to wane in middle age in the middle aged brain, and I think there's certainly some truth to that. Um, it, it you've heard me from time to time struggling uh, because I can't find a word that I'm looking for, uh, like about the primitive cultures, you know, and and uh, that has something to do with this. It's it's um, it's worrisome when it starts to happen because you you know right away you start thinking oh is this an early sign of Alzheimer's am I you know that kind of thing and it has nothing to do with that at all it's just normal brain maturation names are another thing it's uh, it's it can be very difficult sometimes as you get older to remember names and and uh, somebody said something recently uh, you know I asked you for your name I don't remember because I don't listen to it when you tell me what it is and I don't think that's the case I just think we have trouble remembering sometimes. We have uh, the ability to tune out irrelevant material is also something that uh, begins to wane as we age. But the good news is that we, we can make more accurate judgments about people and, and situations. So, uh, the brain uh, is reorganizing during these years. And, and uh, one of those ways is that uh, the middle-aged adult is using both sides of the brain to solve problems more than in the younger years. And this is a bilateralization process, it's called. Education and physical exercise, beneficial for the aging brain. Now here's, I hope this guy isn't really uh, a, a teacher. <laughs> I look at this and I think, oh my God, I wonder if he's a university professor. I guess it kind of looks like he's on a campus somewhere. And, uh, 
clearly this man is stuck somewhere in one of his transitions, wouldn't you say? Uh, that's all I have of those. I, <laughs> I just found a couple that I thought were funny. Um, so personality traits. These are uh, three different ways of looking at personality are mentioned in the text. Uh, enduring characteristics are traits. Are enduring characteristics rooted in early temperament uh, and influenced by gen by our genes and, and by other organic factors. And they're, they, they call them the big five personality traits and, and neuroticism, extroversion, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and openness to experience. Um, and so I, I think there are all sorts of tests out there that, that kind of measure us on those, on those scales. And some may have one other or two others, some maybe not all five, but th these are the big five. And, and, um, studies indicate that, um, th how these traits rank for the individuals remains remarkably stable over time. And, and, uh, the twin studies that are mentioned in the textbook also points to the fact that there's a genetic basis for this. So, so, um, but there, some personality change occurs in adolescence. Uh, some people changing more than others, but nonetheless, the, these these uh, traits tend to remain pretty stable for us. The human agency approach: motives, goals, plans, strategies, values, schemas, and choices are important forces in the adult personality. This uh, this really kind of push or uh, focuses upon the things that we do, the choices that we make in, in terms of, of uh, defining our personality and our identity. And uh, differences says that young adults really kind of try to, well, expand themselves and change the environment to fit their goals in life. Whereas midlife adults are more likely um, to set goals that involve changing oneself to adjust to the environment. Perhaps again that that sort of that life review that we were talking about, I was talking about, in the generativity versus uh, stagnation discussion a few moments ago. And there's a a table that looks at different coping mechanisms that are labeled immature or mature, uh, and as we mature, as we go through adulthood, hopefully. Uh, these coping mechanisms mature with us, with age and experience. Um, theoretically, at least, the more mature adult uses more mature coping mechanisms. The life narrative approach kind of looks upon what the story that we construct about ourselves. The, the person as he or she develops is a storyteller and puts together characters, plots, and themes to develop an evolving story of the self. You have high points, low points, turning points, intersecting plot lines, uh, but these stories all start from their childhood, and 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 oftentimes that childhood, those stories really are given to them from their elders as well. It's really rooted in their culture, and I think uh, in their group's history. But then we add our own experiences onto that to create our own life story. Um, People over 50 tend to be more positive in their descriptions of life than than uh, younger persons. But um, this, uh, you know, this story really is is uh, like you know we can determine how we want to see this. You know, is do we see uh, stressful events as lessons learned, or are they negative turning points, things that have really sent us down the wrong trajectory, that kind of thing, and culture gender, ethnicity, social class, location, all of those things have an impact on our life narrative. I like what the text says that culture provides the menu of stories from which individuals choose. What are those, uh, I, I, we mentioned this earlier and I've been kind of referring to it off and on, but this concept of midlife crisis is a part of that life narrative. You know, for the most part, it's believed that the uh, the idea of a midlife crisis has been overstated, and and uh, I would I, I really think that's the case. Uh, maybe people that are really just stuck and feeling like they haven't done anything with their life or whatever, or perhaps, or you know, have some major change and lack social support. I mean, there's reasons why an individual would experience uh, more distress, say, in midlife than at other times. But I mean, this notion that it's something everybody goes through. <clears throat> 
that we all run out and buy our Porsches uh, as much as I'd like to now, mind you. Um, we, we don't do that necessarily. The other thing, one other kind of myth that um, I think we may have talked about weeks ago, this idea of the empty nest, another myth. Uh, certainly, um, when our last child leaves home, we experience a period of, of transition. Uh, but for many people, I would say perhaps most, it doesn't take long before we begin to see the value of having uh, a child-free life once again. Spirituality, you know, we, we think back to Fowler's theory of faith stages, and, and Fowler believed that, that as one matures, one's spirituality strengthens. But others believe that spirituality uh, develops because of adversity. You know, we have tough times and we need some place to turn. We, we cope with our difficulties by, by becoming more spiritual. But there, there has been studies suggesting that in, in the later stages of a middle adulthood, um, uh, one begins to experience a greater sense of spirituality. Um, as again, as opposed to religiousness or religiosity, uh, because the the religiousness, religiosity, um, studies say tends to be fairly stable across the life course, but but also may increase as adults age. Um, a, a kind of a U curve uh, sometimes where perhaps religiosity is higher in adolescence and higher in, in late adulthood, but not so much in young and middle adulthood. Um, and, and I guess if you just kind of think of that whole process about moving away from parents and, you know, developing one's own own perspective on the world, that makes um, total sense. And so I think many of you find yourselves at the bottom of that U curve at the moment. Um, our childhood experiences with relationships as, you know, going back to the, you know, trust versus mistrust. I mean, it's all based upon things that occurred to us in our childhood and our, in our early years. And, and, um, and, and so it's not to say that you can't, uh, we can't fix that. You can, but, but, uh, deliberately fix it in fact, but, but, uh, some adults don't. And, um, so there's some distinction between a global network, which is all those relationships in our uh, personal and personal relationships connected through the institutions like work and religion and things like this. And then also the personal network, which is the closest relationships, sort of a subset of that of that global network. And why do why do social networks change over the course of life? Um, some um, some social goals ch goals change over the life course, and they result in changes in social relationship. It's called the socio emotional selectivity theory, <laughs> and the social convoy theory, which uh, is a little bit easier to conceptualize, I suppose, is, is that we really travel through life with a, a network of social relationships um, that have both bad and well, they can be very helpful for us. You know, they socialize us, they defend us, they help us. Uh, but they can also um, have a negative impact instead of solving problems. They they can create problems for us. And again, you know, that's not too hard to to uh, to conceptualize. I believe our our social convoys have a lot to do with how how our life proceeds. Romance, romantic love. You know, one big mistake we make in America is. According to, uh, there was a <laughs> was at the time a kind of a revolutionary book in the late 60s, I believe, called The Mirages of Marriage. Letterer and Jackson wrote it. Very famous book in the in the that day, and and the, some of their theories have continued to be um, uh, b well used and taught today. You know, and one of those is that. Uh, one reason perhaps that uh, we have a higher divorce rate in our culture than others is because we we form our marital relationships based on love love being romantic love i should say and you know i mean there's 
what, five or six different kinds of love if you really kind of look it up and break it down. But we're talking about romance here. When you fall in love, head over heels, and, and you get married. And this is considered to be the ideal circumstance for marriage, you know, in our, at least in our popular belief and wisdom. And, 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 of course, it doesn't take too long for the the you know that to begin to lose its excitement and attraction you know the um after uh there there are little stories out there that that basically tell you that you know the frequency of your sexual interaction with your partner after marriage you'll have sex as many times in the first year of marriage as you'll have in the in the next 10 afterwards or something like that put together you know uh, but but it isn't just about sex it's about it's about the way we view the other person and and um that uh, the the bloom is going to come off the rose and if there aren't other reasons for that relationship to exist that's where a lot of relationships fall apart we become disillusioned with each other's of course that you know any good marital therapist would tell you i think that you have to have other reasons for getting married and another separate part here but but this whole notion of romance and passionate love um Really, they're two different processes, but but oftentimes we get kind of bound up in all of those things and their importance. Fisher uh, said that we choose romantic partners based on three three uh, factors: lust, attraction, and attachment. And if you look at if you look at the uh, at the descriptions here, we're talking about androgen hormones, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine. norepinephrine um, serotonin, oxytocins. She's talking about stuff going on in the brain, basically, that cause these feelings. Um, just an interesting thing that she sees uh, uh, the biological basis of romance. There is a truism, I believe, that's also valuable, and I, this has been taught in the context of divorce and remarriage, but, but also um, is true in, in romances, you know, that uh, you bring your prior relationship experiences to, to your present-day partner relationships. Now, that, for, the, for a young person, that, that may mean, you know, the experiences you had in dating and also the experiences you had with your mom and dad and your siblings and your friends. As you go through life into middle adulthood, it may be your prior marriages and your prior romances. And the truism is that, um, you know, if if, um, if if a relationship falls apart and each and, and each individual in that relationship hasn't been able to recognize their contribution to the end of that relationship, the odds are great that that those individuals will take those same problems into the next relationship and it'll repeat themselves. So that implies, you know, that both persons are responsible for the end of the relationship, no matter how it ends. Um, each had a role and, and um, it's vital to recognize that role before moving on to a new relationship. But, but anyway, again, marriage and divorce counseling there. If, if you grow up in a household with a lot of affection and warmth, you're going to be more likely to have long and happy partnerships in adulthood. That, that kind of makes sense, right? Um, we build our skills, our social skills with uh, interactions with our peers that help us to maintain a relationship with partners later. Um, and in heterosexual marriages with balancing of all these roles we have in adulthood, there's also a U curve associated with, with marriage as well. And I say heterosexual marriages here because that's the group that was studied. Uh, it, it, it's likely to be true for uh, homosexual marriages as well. So this uh, U curve, a lot of happiness in the first, <laughs> the first year uh, and later on in life, uh, Maybe when you get the brats out of the house, I don't know, you know, it's, it can be happy again, but in between there's a lot of stresses and strains and it's not always a lot of fun. Um, there are studies out there say that um, unmarried partners, married African-American couples, not coops, but couples and gay and lesbian partnerships are uh, more egalitarian in general. Also, how you cope with the stresses and strains, I think, has to do a lot with where you are in the life course as well. You know, the, the younger you are, the more difficult you're going to have. 
dealing with uh, the the uh, the strains and stresses in a relationship, and particularly with divorce. Children, parenting is an interactive process. Uh, kids raise you as much as you raise your kids, and uh, successful parents um, are will be changed by their children and their children's experiences and their children's needs and demands, and will also change some of their approaches as their own children, their children go through all those developmental phases in the life courses that we've been talking about. It can't be a, a monolith of parenting approaches. You, you've got to be flexible and you've got to be willing to alter and change as, and, and frankly, even for the individual child sometimes. Um, parenting also, like all other things, you know, our prior relationships has a lot to do with how successful we can do. Um, and and the parent child uh, parent minor child relationships influenced by characteristics of both person and how the community or society is organized to meet the needs of the parents and children. Um, you know, good sociology course. You're going to learn about why it is that. Um, uh, parents tend to act like they own their kids, and and I say this uh, sort of with tongue and cheek. I mean, I don't, we don't own our children, but but you're going to run into people who act like they're property, you know. And and uh, frankly, that goes back. It has roots in in uh, sociological theory, you know, in agrarian societies, because children are economic assets. If you're running a farm or or whatever it is that you're doing to to make ends meet, the more kids you have, the better off it's going to be. The more you can produce and all that, and and there are those individuals who believe that's how children come to be seen as property. Although today, they're they're forgive me for saying this for those of you that uh, I, and I do love my own children, but they are more of an economic. Uh, responsibility I guess I don't call them burdens there I just did but but uh, more of a more of a responsibility than an asset uh, in in uh, more developed more affluent cultures such as our own um, you know the, sociology also about men owning women owning their spouses also kind of ties into some of this by the way um, because men can you know, spread their seed and make babies all day long, day after day after day. But women can only produce, well, for the most part, one child every, well, it's more than nine months, I guess, you know, but but periodically, let's say more or less once a year, a little more frequently than that. And so if you have children as an economic asset, then you have a property interest in your wife. You you don't want your female partner producing children for other men for their economic assets. You know, again, please forgive me. I don't believe this. This isn't where my head is at about male female relationships. But, but, and this is really an oversimplification of that whole concept. But, but sometimes I, I, there was a little book I had um, in sociology. Uh, if any of you are interested, let me know and I'll dig up the title for it. But they, there was one one of the chapters dealt with this. And it was just fascinating to read, and you see how these these uh, tendencies we have that seem kind of um, well, I don't know, like troglodytes or something in our you know our relationships with women and children and and things like this. How they have their roots in our in our history and and at a time may have had some logic to them. Aside from uh, agrarian and urban, you know, here there's also a point that. Um, Low-income fathers, especially those unmarried, um, where all the all the um, uh, risk factors they may have for you know for uh, slipping away in the culture and you know not working or you know I don't know having you know issues with drugs or alcohol or crime or whatever. Uh, those individuals see children as as life preservers, not as millstones. So. So uh, economics have something to do with our relationship with our kids as well. Also, one other factor about about women, you know, maternal employment um, tends to, at least for the older, um, not the very young mother who has a couple of kids, but for the uh, older adult, uh, middle adult, and older young adult um, women, that that, that it uh, gives them an improved sense of self, which of course is going to help um, 
better outcomes for children. Now, more young adults in the United States are, are living in the parental home than in previous decades, as we've talked about ad nauseum. But at the same time, some of these young adults are becoming caretakers for their older parents because of delayed childbearing. Um, the older generation delaying childbearing sometimes into their 40s, if not their 30s, or 30s if not their 40s. Um, by the time their children are in their mid-20s, they may have already reached retirement age. And so, depending upon the health of those individuals and everything like this, you know, in Levinson's model, if you're over 65, forget it, the young adults are uh, sometimes becoming caretakers for their older parents because of those uh, sociological idiosyncrasies in our culture. And those young people who have some kind of increased commitment because of things like that obviously we're going to have a shorter period of, of, of time to explore and gain a sense of independence and so it, it does that's one of those I think those factors that uh, would uh, cause the individual that individualization process that Arnett talked about to be circumscribed by circumstances um, you say baby boomers, some of some of the siblings in the baby boomer cohorts are taking care of themselves or each other, I should say. Um, but, uh, you know, this idea about taking care of our, our aging parents, and this really is for the next chapter, except that we're talking about the people here who are taking care of those aging parents. Whether we see it as a burden or gain has a lot to do with our culture. And, and as the last bullet point puts out here, you know, individualistic cultures tend to uh, cause us to see elder care as troublesome. And that's certainly the case in our culture. I mean, we are an individualistic culture for sure. You know, our interaction with our friends declines over the course of adulthood, but the value of that relationship does not decline. Our, we remain close to our friends. Um, and how important friends are in our social convoy varies according to our sexual orientation, our race, our marital status. And, and uh, some of the examples that they talk about um, in, that, uh, in, in that section of the chapter are kind of based on, again, on generalizations. And, and, um, but, but this tends to be the case in, in a larger, from a larger research perspective. We'll talk to grandparenthood there. Uh, my next door neighbors uh, look to me like they're still in their 40s, might be older than that, but I don't think so. Um, pretty much are raising two little girls that are elementary school age with their granddaughters. And uh, the girl's mom comes and goes. Sometimes she lives there, sometimes she doesn't. Occasionally she moves out, and sometimes the girls will move out with her, but then they return, um, you know, Grandparenthood is 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 different in that respect. There are a lot of a lot of uh, grandparents that are caring for their grandchildren, and I don't think that's necessarily what they bargain for. Although I, I have to say, my my neighbor uh, doesn't like his granddaughters moving out, and I don't know. I, I think he enjoys having them around. I also think he he worries about how his his daughter is caring for them, and that's the case in in many of these situations. In a typical let's say, more normative grandparent relationship, you know, where they're not the caretaker, uh, um, they still can play a very, very important socializing role with children. As far as siblings are concerned, young adulthood, uh, sibs tend to drift apart, but in later midlife, they tend to connect again. Uh, but what happens when the last parent dies sometimes is those sibling relationships really, uh, the contact really declines pretty dramatically after that. And um, I can tell you from my own experience, I observe, we observed that in our parents' relationship. We used to visit with the aunts and uncles all the time until our grandparents died. And then all of a sudden, you know, there just wasn't much contact anymore. And, and um, when, when our last parent died, the five of us <laughs> commented, talked about that, in fact, and, and, and made the deliberate decision to, we weren't going to let that happen. And, and we haven't. We've been very successful in maintaining contact uh, and I'm the youngest in my family, so so uh, we we uh, we write every weekend to each other. And uh, what 
trips and vacations we tend to take tend to either be to each other's places or with uh, one or two of them somewhere else. So, so uh, those relationships can become very important in in uh, in uh, middle adulthood in particular, uh, and particularly for myself. You know, somebody who's single. I mean, my kids are grown and uh, they all live in different places, and so so um, sibling relationships are very important to me. Well, work, you know, is a key marker in the transition to adulthood in Western societies. And if you don't meet that marker, um, other transition or other transition markers like being on your own, getting married, having children, all those other things also tend to be delayed or messed up as well. Um, sometimes if you get them out of order, it really those those transition markers come in, in uh, out of order, so to speak. It can be even more more uh, complex. But as I was referring to earlier when we were talking about emerging adulthood, you know, this talks about young males and uh, young males with a high school education are taking longer to reach economic self-sufficiency as compared to 30 some years ago. But young women are more likely to attain self-sufficiency than in earlier times. More women in the job market. Um, we certainly haven't reached gender equality. We know that, but a movement in that direction. Young black males, um, have a particular issue uh, with unemployment and high unemployment rates and and um, a lot of this comes out of the fact that many of them there's been such a dramatic increase in incarceration in the last uh, you know 30 years or so 30 40 years um, and, and a lot of that has to do with I think arrests for um, substance use and and uh, as well as just the socioeconomic uh, spot that many of those young black males find themselves in. Um, there just isn't a place for them in the workforce oftentimes. And so it, it is a kind of a very vicious cycle. And, and any decline in employability is, uh, has terrible implications for the life trajectory of, of, of a young adult. And this includes uh, college graduates. And as the text points out, you know, even even uh, persons with degrees are struggling to find uh, to get a toehold in the uh, in the job market these days. Uh, the text talks about trends in the work patterns of middle-aged workers, and it, it says greater job mobility. And when I think about mobility, I'm thinking, well, you know, people are getting up, picking up and moving to another place so they can have a job. And if they're referring to that, they don't really make that very clear. And what I think they're writing about is job instability. Um, that because of the fact that, uh, you know, employers don't have the dedication to employees they used to have. Um, my father would say, you know, he worked for the, well, for the federal government, for the railway mail service, mostly for um, over 40 years and, and retired, had a nice, comfortable retirement. Now he wasn't wealthy, but he, his needs were tended to, his mom's needs were tended to, or his wife's needs were tended to. Uh, and he was, he said to me, going off to college, you know, and you get a job, you keep that job and you stay with that employer and that employer is going to take care of you. And one of the first things one of my social work professors said to me was, don't stay in one job all your career, you'll burn out, get different jobs, take different perspectives, you know, that's what keeps you alive. And I totally agree with that, by the way. Um, but, um, you know, that was my dad's experience. And he stayed employed through the depression and all that. And so, the time that he grew up certainly had an impact on his perspective. Nowadays, you know, uh, instead of getting hired as an employee, a lot of times you'll find out that you'll be hired on contract, which means, well, the employer doesn't have to worry necessarily about benefits. You have to pay for your own hospitalization if you want it. Um, you know, you don't get vacation time. If you take vacation time, you just don't get paid. You know, um, the employer doesn't have to pay on a pension plan for you, so you better set up your own 401k. You know, you get paid more in a contract, but but you have a lot more burden as far as expenses go. Um, and, and plus, if uh, your employer, you know, doesn't like you, it's easier for the employer or doesn't want to pay you anymore, you know, or don't want to keep paying you, giving you pay raises. Employer can just terminate you if you're on contract. Well, we're not going to renew your contract. So it's hard to, to develop a a dedication to one employer based on that kind of a model. And this is this is going on in, in many different job markets these days, including the social work field, by the way. Um, and so 
many social workers are becoming sort of these uh, sort of independent practice where they have two or three contracts that they're that they have and they're kind of you know patching it all together to to make full time employment. Um, personally, I preferred you know having one job and keeping that job, but uh, it, it may be more interesting to do it another way. I don't know, but but things times are changing and and this is something that's certainly affecting adults of you know both males and females and things like this and that has a lot to do with uh, you know where you work um, your gender your class your race all those kinds of things about employability and getting hired uh, but it also impacts your retirement you know so so uh, you know understand even in your young years you're going to want to start putting money away for retirement uh, without delay because it, the day does come when you retire believe it or not and and uh you know the if you have a decent nest egg set aside it's going to make it a lot easier for you i can tell you from personal experience um but um there and also you know there's a, a lot of times people such as myself i retired from full-time employment four years ago and yet i continue to work sometimes it seems almost full-time uh, teaching part time for the for the university, you know, and it's become a very important part of my life and my budget and and all of those things. And someday that'll probably well, I'm sure it'll end someday. And and um, but but this is not an uncommon experience nowadays with people. You don't most people don't just retire and never work again. Many of them even go back to their old employers on contract and and things like that. So so that's another uh, you know another trend in the workforce these days um, and also those with more education prior to midlife are more likely to retrain in middle adulthood when I guess when one's staking stock of of uh, one's life you know and not satisfied with the direction it's been going retraining is there to start in another direction but again, this this is a theme that kind of runs through all of our our sections. Cumulative disadvantage. Remember talking about that earlier. That uh, marginalization in the labor market in adulthood results from cumulative disadvantage. Um, so why do we need affirmative action? There's one of the answers. Cumulative disadvantage. So just a couple slides and we're done. What, what, what does all this mean for us? It means we should be uh, familiar with the unique pathways our clients have traveled to reach adulthood. Become familiar with their life, their life story and, and um, uh, the high points and low points, the turning points and those kinds of things. Spend time listening to your client about that. Um, if you're working with a young adult, you know that the social roles that individual is, is developing uh, may be different later in young, or maybe, I'm sorry, in older adolescent, it may be different in young adulthood. And likewise, in young adulthood, it may be different in middle adulthood again. Understand the client's culture, understand uh, how family expectations are figuring in on, on their life trajectory. Um, explore a little bit about their ideas about gender roles, um, all those kinds of things. Help young adults master the tasks involved in developing intimate relationships, uh, you know, in an appropriate fashion, of course, you know, with, uh, you know, with whatever means is at your disposal to do that. And as far as midlife clients are go, help them to um, think about their own involvement in generative activities and the meaning that this has for them, you know, basically helping them maybe to take stock with their lives. Yes, there's a train nearby. My husky will howl sometimes when the train blows its whistle. It's just the coolest thing to hear. Um, understand ways that social systems promote or deter people from maintaining or achieving health and well-being. Be aware of the stability and the capacity for change in personality and middle adulthood. Both are present there. There's, there are areas of stability. There are also areas that are ripe for change in almost anyone willing to collaborate and advocate um, and uh, really you know just engage your client a midlife client and looking at their involvement in their relationships and 
and uh, the organizations in their life and help them assess whether or not uh, they're where they want to be. So that's it for middle, young and middle adulthood. Look at this. If it had been my book, we'd have tied up two chapters in one lecture. So I hope this uh, was useful to you and um, we'll be talking again soon. Okay. Uh, see you later. Bye.